And hello, Barry, how are you? I'm good. How are you, Alyssa? Thank you for having me here. Yes, of course. Uh, the the things are reverting. One time you invited me. Now is my time to invite you. Uh, this is a, a conversation, a friendly conversation. And of course, if you want to hear more or see more of my videos, you can subscribe. We all know that YouTube has a button to subscribe. And of course, questions can go when when you see the video, can go under it. And are you willing to answer questions if I get any questions for you? Of course. Oh, okay. Okay, we'll share with you if I get any questions about uh, your work or about your art life. So Barry, I don't want to start asking you about your, your art. Um, I will ask you directly, who are you as an artist? more than what you do as an artist. Who are you? Who is Barry? If, if you know, if I, I have that curiosity, who is Barry as an artist? I haven't met the fellow. <laughs> well, <laughs> I know no, it's, it's a good question. I would say uh, uh, I'm playful, but I'm serious. Um, <clears throat> I think I'm I'm at the core of who I am when I'm an artist creating, whether it's ceramics, painting, teaching, doing anything sort of around the arts, uh, talking to you about it, going to a gallery with friends or with my family, um, or setting up platforms, like having been a gallerist or having written about art or setting up talks. Uh, I don't know, it seems like I couldn't describe describe it, but no, that's it. That's me. Um, that's what I did when I was younger. I enjoyed going into museums, um, mm -hmm. like sports too. But you know, it's uh... well, uh, I, you know, there is not a a good or bad answer. It's your answer, and I I like what you said. So uh, that's a, that's enough for me. And I can picture you that art is almost everything that you do in your life. Uh, like most of the artists, everything becomes an art situation. So I guess Barry is an, is an artist 24 hours a day, I guess. <laughs> well, these are the plants behind me, which are growing out of my fish tanks and growing up the wall. And I sort of always play and arrange it. And, you know, so more fish tanks, photographed by Dan Asher. So, you know, you set up little things, uh, little installations in your home. Uh, maybe art is, uh, when I cook, I it's like an artful practice. It's very different than my, when I paint, which is very more expressive and messy. When I cook, I'm very clean and orderly, but I, <laughs> I consider it an artful way that I do it. Yes, um, yes, I was guessing correctly. <laughs> so Barry, uh, one time I asked you, but I would like to ask you again, do you think that the arts can change the world? Uh, what what can we do as artists? How can we help our human community? Do you think that we have any role as artists? I think we do, but the problem is it needs to be supported and funded. Mm -hmm. So yes to everything there's so many possibilities but it doesn't happen unless the artwork is seen and it impacts people mm -hmm. and people teach and you know there are just so many museum walls uh if everybody can have a voice on a platform in social media then nobody has a voice yeah so it's very complicated um i I know people a lot like what they were when they were younger. Mm -hmm. So I'm wary if people can change. Mm -hmm. So like I live in the Northeast and I'm in a, we're in a segmented United States. And I don't see too many conservatives changing, although I know a Republican that switched five years ago. So, and that's a terrible narrow definition of a person, but uh, 
I like to think art can change and enlighten. I know when I make art, it enlightens me when I do it right, so to speak, when I put intention in. Um, and I know it can give understanding to people when they really take it in. Um, but art is less than 1% of everybody's time in their, in their life. They mm -hmm. live, they go to work, they have family, they have bills. So I got to say art's relevance um, is relatively nil, unfortunately. But I think that's a realistic assessment. Well, I think that it, it has the potential and maybe it's like a colleague, Christian Dalgard, told me that it, it's like a small tool that you start picking a wall and you have to do a hole, but it goes like tick, tick, tick. And it, it goes very like a, a, like a slow motion and all that, but still maybe one day we can just get a hole in that wall and see the other side. <laughs> It's a good definition, I think. And I understand what you're saying. Funding is super important. The support of, you know, government and, you know, the society, The it's it's really important. But I think that, like you said, I like a lot, the intention to, to do it with that uh, positive mind. Maybe if we don't change the world like a big, revolution we can change maybe our neighbor or somebody right exactly. Uh, exactly i have a you know just coming back to to your work i was very surprised to see this is i mean the the sculptures i know you as a painter so tell me about this who is buried with these uh, artworks so uh I did sculpture in New Rochelle High School when I was, I guess, 16 and 17. Um, in college, they had a ceramic studio at Vassar. I found it. We got to use it and play with clay. Mm -hmm. um, and then I sort of stopped. But about 12 years ago, I started to do it again. And mm -hmm. I worked with an artist in the city who was showing in galleries. And I got my skills back and then some. And I was working five days a week for a couple of years. And uh, I love clay. I, I, you know, all these pieces you're looking at here are unfired, except the bottom right is bisque. It's not glazed. Mm -hmm. um, I do a variety of things. These are hand built using different techniques. Top right is a sort of slab construction where I play with slabs combined. Um, in this case, I put lines in. Um, you know, I try and open up form. I, I like working sculpturally in clay top right especially you can't do that in painting painting is very limiting it's very mm -hmm. two-dimensional that sounds like a stupid silly statement but that's very restrictive you know mm -hmm. ceramics and three-dimensional objects I, I encourage all artists to explore something three-dimensional uh, and the bottom right it's a it's a smaller object but it's simple play sometimes I go for simplicity and work and a few bands and a few dots and you almost get a Picasso figure from his like surrealist 1930s era in the bottom right figure. It's a little face on there. It's foreshortened. And even the hands where I put the little strips in. And when I do stuff like that, I don't think of Picasso. I'm working from simplicity. I get form and I'm like, you know, that looks like. And when I draw, sometimes after I draw, I'm like, that looks like Giacometti. And it's a lot to say, but I didn't share drawings with you but you'd see when i draw the figure that's how i tend the, yeah. top, the top left is a different piece that piece i go ahead and you know how you doodle uh with pencil i started to doodle and holding some clay when i was on the phone and i developed some form that of course you couldn't get if you plan because you're subconsciously free or you're consciously free and your subconscious is free to roam and uh I go ahead and I play with just one piece that fits in my hand. And the idea is curve in. And a lot of art is point counterpoint. And so it was in, it's out and, you know, creating certain things. Then I go ahead with the individual things I've made and I start assembling. And what I've constructed are some figures, not unlike uh, um, the futurist sculpture that I respect very much, not with an intention to do it, 
but I end up, you know, working. It, it, this is a project I'm still doing. And sometimes my projects happen and I haven't had a studio now for three years. I'll go back to that when I have clay again and I'll work on some more. It's, it's a gateway project for me. Mm -hmm. uh, and bottom left, you see the simple shape, but I, you know, I made some eyes. I cut out the whole, the negative and positive chain space for the nose to switch simple horizontal lines you know it's it goes a long way a little diagonal on the line for the eye for the eyelash little subtle changes well um, uh, yes and i agree with you it's a great uh, possibility to work with clay clay it touches the earth i think that is a different you you touch it with your fingers it's different than paint it's i totally agree that uh, it's to practice at least once in a lifetime for an artist is a good practice. In your case, you advance. I mean, it's not one time, but I think that is it's a very important practice, especially the when you touch clay. I did clay too, and I understand totally what you are saying. It, it's it's a different relationship with clay than with other materials, definitely. And, and you you hit the nail on the head because you're holding it it's so tactile mm -hmm. and a brush you know yeah you hold a brush but it doesn't give you much love you know it's a point at the end you're trying to pull paint off of mm -hmm. but with the clay your hands have multiple fingers doing different things two hands both sides of the brain being engaged at the same time mm -hmm. you know, it's quite a beautiful uh you know process yes it is uh, i see that uh, talking you mentioned Picasso, you mentioned drawing. Uh, well, I had to come to this image that I have of your work. Tell me about this. Uh, I'm really fascinated to see different moments of your art. And what is, what is the size of what? I mean, I see pencil, but tell me about this uh, work. So this is, uh, I, had a, I have a sketch pad. It's probably 10 by 14 or so, mm -hmm. you know, something like that. Uh, maybe and uh, this was during COVID. Mm -hmm. I remember I was with uh, Kathy, my fiance, and you know when I draw people, I don't draw people. You know, I, I draw maybe form and movement and line, but I don't really care about ratio. So I get humanesque form, but I don't get the person, and I mm -hmm. exaggerate in right and wrong places. I don't really care about that. Sometimes I do, but rarely. Um, so while I was doing this, I also. You know, when you draw, it's how you hold the pencil. It's if you use the front of your hand, the wrist, the elbow, the shoulder. This is something that I engage more of a swirl, a different motion. And a few other things are going on here. So, uh, you know, line dependent, you know, sort of free. And then uh, the line directs what I color in and creates the positive negative play. And, you know, if you do eyes right, this comes up in artist talks a lot. If you do the eyes eyes right, that's a lot of the, you know, space of a painting emotionally to the viewer. And these yeah. eyes sort of do it. And of course, the breasts, I did those right. When you do stuff like that, you got to be present. All the sort of weakness and strength in my hand at the same time has got to be doing and not seeing. That's the tricky thing. You, you don't, you don't want to see yourself drawing. You want to be in the drawing, drawing, so you sort of see, have a vision, and you got to translate. You got to, if you let go right, you can do complicated form. If you tighten up a little, I can't get those irregular swirls. They're they're coming from some other strength that I'm pushing through, and this it seems simplistic in the shapes in the bottom middle, but by angling this way or that way it shifts the plane like a cubist drawing in a way. And even mm -hmm. though I don't color them in or shade them out, it does fracture the space. I think a lot of our history is the history of fracturing the picture plane. Even in the 18th century, uh, the sitter would sit with their arm forward and it would be coming into the space. And then of course, Picasso would break it up, uh, you know, in a major way and it continued. You know, artists who slash paintings, Rauschenberg building out of the painting, you know, so fracturing the canvas uh, is a central theme 
I think in the history of art. And and do you do the, I mean the drawings in the in your pad, and then you go to a painting from there, or they are separate processes? You know, I I heard an artist speak once when we were talking, and he goes, after a sketch, it's dead. I said what? And it made so much sense when he explained it. I never do that. I to me, it's like I do it and it's done. Mm -hmm. uh, if I go to a painting, I don't draw something and then paint. I strictly paint. Um, and I even have problems. I'm not able to lay down a base color on a painting and then paint. Because I would treat the act of laying down the base color. I'm sure I'd vary it. It's just I get too uh, responsive to the act of painting. And so, uh, no, I, I don't do that. But yes, it could work. It could work. Yes, but I <clears throat> I agree with you. Sometimes you put so much into the the actual pad that then it will be like copying yourself. <laughs> I think that uh, just that energy that went into the pad, maybe it cannot go exactly again to the painting. I think that uh, I heard other artists also saying the same, that uh, when they sketch, they do it very briefly, not to take all the surprise and all the energy, uh, from mm, the sketch to the actual painting. Uh, so, Barry, uh, for some reason, I relate, that's why I ask you, this painting, I relate it with that sketch. It has like a similar flavor. Even the, it has a similar flavor to your sculptures. I don't know if you see that, but I see a rhythm between the first the sculptures in clay with the drawing and now the painting, they have a continuity. Do you see that? Oh, yes, and I, I think there is a continuity in all my work and it's the brush, the line, the movement. I know that sounds general, but it, it comes out in little works and in larger works. This is a unique piece. This is where I try to answer that problem of how do I take, because I have a very nice expressive line drawing sort of expressionism that I do naturally, how do I get that into a canvas? So for this one, I went ahead and I used marker and I drew and I didn't draw from life. I actually looked at one of my drawings. And of course it was a, when we had two models, which was very rare for me. I'm usually, usually when I drew in the South Bronx, one model at a time, um, mm -hmm. but I was able to get it. I was able to get with the line, what I wanted, the black line. And then I did a sort of technique that I do where when I give an expressive loose line and get overlays, I then color in the areas it sets up in what looks like a formulaic and you get it like a gorky effect and mm -hmm. you leave some edge. So the line lays out all these little ovals and uh, triangles and weird shapes and I color them in and that's something I, I do in paintings now, in different paintings, the background just playing off sort of light greens. I was happy in this painting sold. Um, <laughs> happy about that. Yes, of course, of course. And good for the collector. Good choice for the collector. So, and we come to what you were saying about uh, playing with lines and, you know, I don't know if this is, I know that you had a, big commission do you want to just tell me a little bit more about and is this one of the works for that commission this is this is uh one of 22 paintings that i had a commission for a condominium that had two buildings 11 floors combined that took two paintings on each floor and uh you know i was approved for like two or three styles of work that i was doing mm -hmm. and of course while I continued to paint, I varied the styles and I showed it and they sort of liked everything, which is very nice. Um, here, just like in drawing, you can use a large R movement. And a lot of my paintings, I use small brush movements and get a small dash. Here, I went more from the shoulder and mm -hmm. I got into the simplicity of a simple arc and then adding white and, you know, this sort of, uh, you know, almost simple color field painting. Uh, a few little twists and turn to trick the space 
and to get some depth. Um, I enjoyed them. They were, uh, you know, uh, they were 30 inch by 40 inch paintings, mm-hmm. all purple. Uh, I introduced purple and some other colors trying to, uh, you know, I think I, what I've learned from this a little better is how to work from the purples and the blacks. I used mm-hmm. to stay away from that, but it's it's very important, I think, in painting. Um, the, and, <clears throat> yeah, my question is: the commission is I'm uh, um, I'm guessing that is a uh, permanent on permanent display. Oh yeah, so they bought the paintings. They bought the paintings for you know decoration for their mm-hmm. uh, you know uh, building, and uh, it's a way for artists to have revenue. And then of course the paintings are there and the, the people who live there can see it become potential clients and of course you know it just becomes uh you know hopefully it has legs as they say well they they look like a, an interesting collection to have a, a small catalog maybe that could be like something that you can compile it in a catalog or maybe the the people that uh, commission you can have a catalog of opinions uh, that, uh, that's a good idea that's a good idea yeah especially because they are they are all from a collection and they are in a, in the same place the same buildings and you know that could be really a nice touch for people that are coming to the building to have that available just an idea you know that we are having a friendly conversation so it just occurred to me when i saw this painting and thinking there are 22 paintings uh, it could have like a, a nice introduction and a, I think that they, they could be a, a nice catalog. It would actually make a lot of sense because since it's two paintings, you know, when you open the book, the paintings are left and right. So it would yeah. show very well. Uh, that mm-hmm. could be interesting. Good idea. Thank you. <laughs> you are welcome. It's just, uh, it occurred to me while you were talking, I was already visioning the catalog. <laughs> so coming to what you were saying because if one thing brings to the other this is when you talk about a like a short strokes yes and this is again a unique work because you know you know one of the biggest burden for an artist is this artwork or her artwork and it's terrible to say that but it's true because my artwork has traveled with me through i don't know 20 different storage spots or you know, well, at one point, the objects were in nine spots at once, different spots. Mm-hmm. Um, eventually, a, an artist, if you're an artist, you make a lot of art. That's, you know, it's sort of like if you're a cook, you cook a lot of food. So mm-hmm. if you're an artist, there should be a lot of work. And that becomes a burden. Recently, I've been lucky. I have a storage space. I put everything together. It's all in one spot. And I got to see some of my old paintings. Mm-hmm. This was an older painting. And they did something I ne- I tell artists never to do, which is don't go back into your old paintings. <laughs> it's sort of like a historical record of what you thought at the time. And they're off, they had their value and their aesthetic. And your current thoughts may be really wrong as far as what they think about that earlier work. But even though I liked the earlier work, I knew I was onto something with this new style. But basically, I just kept going with the dashes and the flow. And so this was a tree very abstracted tree that I did 25 years ago uh, with a lot of lines. Um, but then I went ahead into it again and um, I play in the geometric shape and little curves or little angles read for depth. At the same time, it reads flat, like you're looking from the sky down, like an aerial view. Okay. Um, I see that. Uh, you know, my intention is to move color that is beautiful in its local area. Mm-hmm. And my theory is that means it should work throughout the canvas. I know that's not true, but I, I let myself be ignorant because then I can work an area really good. And then I hope by, you know, usually when I work a color, I work it in an area and I bring it to other areas. Then I hope that beauty sort of collects in all the areas and becomes more than the localized areas. Mm-hmm. Uh, doesn't always work because you can have one weak spot and that can ruin a painting, so to speak, because it'll draw weight. The painting is very hard, the balance um, in it. I, I am very happy with this piece. I, I really enjoy this piece. And now that you say that it, it has a tree involved, um, 
it reminds me to Mondrian. I am sure that you saw the sequence from realism to uh, abstract of a tree. Uh, if if not, I recommend you and anybody that uh, is listening to see that sequence. It's like a popular, very popular sequence of realism to abstraction uh, from Mondrian. And I, I, I don't know why it reminds me to him. I like this piece and I think that is, it's a well-balanced and it talks to me. I mean, besides all the des technical description. Um, Barry, uh, talking about all the experience that you have and also I have to say your generosity. I think that I already told you, but I, I want to make it as a statement. You're a very generous artist and also a presenter and coordinator of talks and artists' talks. And uh, what will you tell to a person that just begin? Uh, like, you know, it doesn't have to be a person that end college. It could be any person that begins to touch the arts, let's say as a curiosity and as a profession, not only like a weekender that tries gardening and a painting and then something else. I'm talking about a person that feels that a, is committed to begin a career in in arts, in visual arts. What will be your your tip? What is comes, you know, as a as a tip? Well, and I think this would apply whether, you know, you find yourself in your fields of visual arts or you find your field is being a fireman a fireman or anything, um, I think, uh, and it's going to sound really corny, but dreams do come true. They just take 20 years to make them happen. So if you have a dream and a vision as an artist or as an actor or a vision for yourself as a business person or to be a fireman who saves people, if you hold fast to that vision and love it like a dream, and of course, then you work at it. Because if you want to be an artist, you're going to draw. And then you're going to look maybe to go to school for art or take classes or go to galleries. So you're going to do 97% of the work. But when you do that and have a vision, the weird thing that happens is you don't get your vision right away. But if you put the time in, in 20 years, you do. And it's because you've like, you have like the mitochondria of your life. You have the engine is your vision. And as long as you keep feeding it. Now, it sounds ignorant to say, because what if you're born into poverty and you have nothing and you, you, you got to get, you know, money for food. The odd thing is somehow it can all work. You can't, you can't have an answer and say, oh, you do this and that's it. But I know if you if people slowed down, they just breathed, they just thought or didn't think and didn't react to the news, I think we'd be in a better place. And I think with art, if you sort of, you make your own dream, you want to get into the Whitney, you want to do a sculpture on the beach, you want to weave and put it on a tree, whatever it is, you can do it. The artists who succeed are those that make their own rules, not just in their artwork, but how they get accepted. And they go ahead. And so you can set up acceptance. And yes, I just applied for a, a project, a $150,000 project. And no, I wasn't one of the top five to get the project. So I apply again and apply again. And some people tell you don't apply for this, but you know, for $150,000, I'll apply. I don't mind. So um, uh, the point is you do keep trying. You got to hold on to your dream, but you got to work at it. And along the way, you'll probably meet people, some that are very good, and have really good advice and can help you. And then you'll meet some other people quite the opposite. And you'll have to know the difference. Yeah. <laughs> well, that that's a good way to end my, my your response to my question. But uh, Talking about the uh, generosity I mentioned, but I would like you to maybe put uh, an ad. You will say an ad. Uh, tell me about uh, the talks that you are 
coordinating just to to keep it uh, in this video i mean just to invite people okay people will, will see will watch this video just you know it's an open invitation i guess so now is your turn to invite people to to your to your talks so i have a youtube channel uh barry kostrinsky uh under my name and on there i have the last four talks that i did before that, I did about 85 talks during the heart of COVID every week. And that was under an umbrella with the Artist Talk on Art, an organization I was president of. Now it's under my own. It's a similar vision. My vision is to have artists talk on art. My vision is to have artists speak, to engage, to have dialogue with each other, and also to present um, a variety of artists. And it's about, I think mostly, it's about setting up a platform so I enjoy coming here and speaking, but as opposed to me coming and speaking, you could have picked somebody else. So in essence, you, Alyssa, set up the time slide. And so you set up the art event that feeds a lot or a little, and all these littles make a difference. So likewise, when I set up a talk, I want to set it up so artists can talk, engage. The oddest thing I noticed when I opened a gallery in the South Bronx in like uh, 2000, 2005, I started to notice the artists met each other. A lot of them knew each other, but most of them didn't. And all of a sudden, this weird community, and 15, 20 years later, they're friends, they're family, people got married, you know, people <laughs> sex, you know, and all these different things go on. And so it, it's, I think being a connector is easy, but it's really rewarding. And I guess the summary of it all is, you know, when I started to get back into my art in like 95 and started thinking about how great it is to have an exhibit and that of course the goal as an artist or one of the goals I then realized well if I had a gallery I could give exhibits to hundreds of artists and so it was a no-brainer and that's sort of the way I think I'll continue to paint I'll try and sell my art but I realized the easy way is set up a platform and make it work for other people you set up a community um and it grows a lot more than you realize. It becomes a very good good. Yes, I agree because I participated in your talks, the previous ATOA, and now the on your own brand, just to say it in one way. Uh, and what days, if somebody wants to join uh, an artist, what days are you planning? Are you continuing with Monday? Just the... Uh, to be specific, I mean, what is your plan? I did Mondays in July and August. Uh, come September, I'm going to move to Tuesdays at six o'clock. I look mm -hmm. to do it every every uh, uh, Tuesday. I I just developed my website. I have a sort of column on the website. It's under barrykostrinsky.com. I'm not publicizing yet because it's still in in the works. Uh, but Yes, I am going to sort of have it laid out who's coming and who's speaking, and um, I, I will publicize it more. Um, but yes, coming to Tuesdays, still on Mondays, and uh, it's been a lot of fun. And, uh, and it will be, it will continue at 6 p.m.? I'm thinking, yes, I'm thinking of sticking with that. I always, whenever I do a project, I sort of have a vision for it, and then I see what happens. And so right now, uh, not much has happened. So it's sort of, you know, in limbo. If I see a movement for a different time or this or that, then that'll happen uh, or a different format. That might even happen. But yeah. right now, uh, it's it's sort of moving along. Uh, yes. And also, well, summer is, you know, it's a different, August is a different month for many people that they take vacations or something like that. But uh, okay, well, we know now September will be Tuesdays, 6 p.m. So if somebody wants to hear more about it, they can write on under the, well, the comments for YouTube comments and I'll pass it along and you'll share your, your link so people can attend, especially visual artists. I invite everybody, it's very friendly. You're friendly people, uh, they, they are regulars that they, they get to be more friends and artists' friends. So anyway, um, coming to, you know, just talking about you as an artist, 
as you see, I didn't introduce you with any bio, resume, etc. because I want people to discover you. This is, for me, a way to know a little bit more of you. It's difficult to know a lot about uh, our friends. So this is a wonderful way for me to learn more about you and your art, especially in the visual arts. No, I mean, no private life, but your uh, your your life as an artist, but how people can find you? Is it your website? Is it Insta on Instagram? What is the best way to learn more about you? And people can read your bio and and just... Uh, well, the, the hardest thing is to spell my last name. You can spell my last name, you can find everything about me. Uh, since it's unique, Kostrinsky, uh, It'll get you to my Instagram, my Facebook, to articles I've written for Broadway World. Um, eventually, it'll get you to my website, too, uh, depending how the uh, SEO works on that. I'm on LinkedIn. So I'm actually a pretty public figure. And I always find, you know, if you want to find me, you can. And my full name at Gmail is my email. And, of course, in your notes, I'll put all the links, you know, so you can see and you piece it all together, there are articles about me too online. You can see, oh, he was doing this. That's that gallery he spoke about. Or, oh, he was working with a body painter. Or, you know, there's always, there's a lot of different slices to me. Yeah, no, I, I know that people can, nowadays they can find you by typing name and last name. But this, uh, this conversation will have your name, your full name, people can copy your last name. I know I have my my own situation with my last name too. So, uh, but hey, they can find us, right? It's not uh, just so difficult. So before we end that, this conversation that it was very nice to have you, Barry, do you want to say something that I didn't ask you? Do you want to tell how you started or what is your inspiration nowadays or something or a message like a, let's say one last thought that you want to say not a question that I ask but you know just your own thoughts um one thought I've had about art in general is sort of art is a discourse against entropy entropy being sort of destruction decay and things falling apart. And you could describe art as that which puts together and builds and sort of brings order or balance. Um, it, I hate to be political, but it took a long time to build the Twin Towers in New York City. And that's the effort, it's a long effort. Unfortunately, it's very quick and easy to destroy those buildings mm -hmm. with an airplane. I like building sandcastles when I go to the Water, I do very good drip castles, very free, very dowdy like. But I do notice when kids come by, they like to play, but kids also come by and they like to knock down sand castles. We mm -hmm. all know that's a lot of fun. I think in there is the problem of mankind. Mm -hmm. That balance between wanting to knock down the sand castle and building one. I think as artists, we've got the greatest job in a way because we can. Uh, build and create we can make objects we can you want to make a pig with a lion's body and wings you can do it in ceramics you want to paint it and show them from the back looking in a mirror we really can't create and i think you know not to be godlike but i can understand why the bible is sort of anti-artist in the way because you're the hand of the creator and that's god's role and uh Bitsala was the uh, artist in the Bible, and I associated with him because that is my deeper name. And Bitsala um, was an organizer of the artists. And I know it's crazy, but uh, his father was a metal smith, and my father was a metal smith. Wow. And my son was bar mitzvah. The rabbi pointed out it's really odd. The section where Bitsala is in the Bible is being read by a Bitsala. So I identify as an artist, as just a person, but I also feel maybe I, there's more to me that's associated as an artist in the past. And I think, uh, you know, you find in yourself what you and you do you, and that's the best you can do. Well, or anything. Barry, with this, 
I asked you a few minutes ago uh, if arts can change the world uh, or how we can contribute uh, to any changes. But this answer is very powerful. It was not an answer. It was your own comment because you talk about building, no destruction. I mean, that is huge. I mean, if we can just show the world that we can build and dream, like you said, we can become and dream. That's a great uh, message for humanity, I think. So that was a great, uh, great comment. Thank you for that, Barry. Okay, well, I think that we are getting to our end of this conversation that I can continue for hours, I think. Every time that I, I meet you uh, online, uh, you know, I have a feeling, oh, this, we can continue this conversation. I think that they are very rich and, and really thank you for taking the time from your schedule. I know that it's not an easy thing to stop your activities and come and talk to me, but I think that is rewarding for me and I hope it will be rewarding for people to listen. Okay. Thank you, Alyssa. Thank you. Thank you. Okay.